Okay, I'm gonna try and get more fluffy bear dice then. Um, da -da 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 -da. A strange noise pierced through the fog of sleep. I was curious about it, so I groggily roused myself. Hmm? It's already morning. I slept pretty well. Uh, oh, right! The strange voice. Or, well, I guess it's more like a mo I looked around, grasping the situation. Oh, I used Papa as a mattress. It had been my father moaning. My bunny backpack was sprawled sideways in the spot where I'd originally been sleeping. Oh, did I move around a lot in my sleep? Hmm, well, it's already time to wake up, so it doesn't matter. Father, wake up! I shook him, but he wouldn't wake up. He seemed to be having a nightmare. I wonder what he's dreaming. I guess there's no other option. I pinched his nose and held my hand over his mouth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, he's awake. <coughs> Nima, good morning. Either he didn't understand what was happening or was still half asleep because Papa seemed dazed. He doesn't realize I cut off his air supply to wake him up. Mm, good morning. Breakfast, I'm hungry. Let's get dressed and find some food. I urged Papa to hurry, and finally we headed into the parlor. The houses in this village were similar to traditional Japanese homes. It reminded me of my grandmother's place in the countryside, which left me feeling nostalgic. That's why I considered this room the parlor instead of the living room. For breakfast, we ate a savory porridge made with the leftovers from last night's stew. It contained mixed grains instead of rice, but was tasty. This meat on the bone is the secret ingredient. I could tell this was a time-consuming dish to make. The fact that it contains bones means that person cooking it must have spent a lot of time skimming the foam to keep it from getting bitter. Could I have some more? I asked the village chief's wife hesitantly once I finished my serving. I'm glad you enjoyed a simple rural dish like this. The village chief's wife scooped more porridge into my bowl with a broad smile, seeming happy I'd asked for seconds. Your cooking is amazing. Of course I like it. Oh, I'm so happy. In that case, I'll pack you an extra special yummy lunch to take with you. Yay! Wait. A packed lunch? Why would we need that? With my arms still raised in celebration, I tilted my head confused. We're going into the forest today. I wanted to leave you here, but... My father supplied. Of course I'm going. If you try to leave me behind, I'll follow you. Even if someone's watching me, I'll have soul's magic up my sleeve, so I'll figure something out. Probably. It will be dangerous, so you must listen to me carefully. Papa explained that there had been a series of monster attacks in this region recently. Knights were dispatched to deal with the monsters, but the attacks hadn't stopped. For this reason, they built a fortress and stationed knights here permanently. The purpose of this trip was to survey the forest and determine the best place to build the fortress. Hmm, isn't this a bit unusual? Normally, Papa wouldn't be willing to bring me to such a dangerous place. I wonder what he's thinking. Father, why did you bring me along? If it's for a dumb reason, I'm telling Mama. I'm sorry to ask, but I'd like you to serve as an intermediary between us and the fire dragon, he confessed. Huh? What does he mean? An intermediary with Soul? Maybe he wants Soul to get rid of the monsters? I wouldn't suggest that plan. Well, I suppose it's okay if he doesn't mind the forest being annihilated in the process. The fire dragon knows a lot about monsters. I thought he could give us some insight into the cause of these attacks. Oh, right! Soul is a living encyclopedia. Or rather, a living record of history. I wonder if he knows something. In that case, I'll ask him. I closed my eyes and pictured Soul in my mind as I normally did. Soul! Mr. Soul, Lord Soul, there's no need to call so many times, child. Uh, you're totally missing the point. I'm setting the mood. Well, you see, I'm accompanying my father on a tour of his territory, and there have been a lot of monster attacks lately. Do you know anything about it? Monsters, hmm? And where exactly has this been happening? Oh, now that he mentions it, I don't know where we are. Father, what's the name of this village? Papa, stop looking at me like you're shocked that I don't know. If I don't know, then I don't know, okay? Even if you told me just yesterday, I've clearly forgotten. I was busy and focused on eating, you know. It's Gilbert Proxy, e Proxy Ekoff. He'll understand if you tell him it's in the natal for frost forest. I conveyed what Papa had told me to Sol. Sol was surprised when he heard. Hardly any monsters lived in the natal, for natal frost forest. Those that existed were isolated individuals defeated in turf wars and driven out of the mountains. What kinds of monsters were there, I asked on Sol's behalf. No matter the situation, gathering intel comes before all else. I deeply regretted not doing any research in preparation for this trip because I was lulled into a false sense of security by the fact that Papa would be with me. The most commonly reported sightings were of goblins. There were also kobolds and even a few reports of frost spiders, I believe, Papa explained. Huh. 
Goblins and kobolds are the most standard of standard fare. I assume frost spiders are a type of spider exclusively found in snowy climates. In any case, I convey this information to Sol. According to Sol, goblins and kobolds were natives to a more southern climate. Based on the little I heard, I figured there were four possible explanations. First, the monsters had begun reproducing like crazy due to the abundance of food and the lack of natural predators in this area. However, Sol refuted this theory. Second, the monsters had fled from their natural predators. These predators had reproduced pro prolifically in the goblins and other monsters' natural habitats, forcing them to flee north. Papa shot this theory down based on the fact that monster attacks hadn't increased in any of the other territories. Third, it was a man-made problem. Seemed unlikely, but we couldn't discount the possibility that humans had gathered the monsters together and driven them here for some reason. Fourth, it was God's doing. That seemed like the most likely explanation to me. When I suggested the God theory, the response was, for what purpose? They wouldn't be asking that if they knew him. God had a track record for meddling. Papa's subordinates also joined in. For over an hour, we all bashed through various theories, or hashed through various theories. In the end, we went through the process of elimination, working through the possible causes one by one and disproving them. If this was a man-made problem, there should be some evidence of human involvement. The village chief's wife had finished preparing our lunch, so it was time to set off. Into the forest we go. Before that, we needed to get properly outfitted. I put on the pendant containing the magic stones I received from the king and queen and stashed the dagger Grandpa Ghosh had given me in the stomach of my bunny backpack. Papa and his subordinates geared up for a fight. Based on their armor, I realized that the five men who joined us in Arcenta were knights. They belonged to the Royal Knighthood First Legion Northern Territory Division. That means only two people accompanying us are Papa's direct subordinates. I guess he doesn't feel the need to travel with a huge entourage? A hunter from the village agreed to act as our guide through the forest. Currently, we followed a barely discernible animal trail. If we stray from the path even a little, we could get lost. Nox flew in wide circles above us, making sure nothing abnormal was in our path. I thought it must be nearly impossible to see anything from the sky due to the dense foliage, but maybe with the bird's sharp vision, it was possible? I'd always heard that hawks had amazing vision, but doubted how much Nox could see. We continued until the sound of crunching leaves reached us. We weren't the only ones, ma we weren't the ones making this noise. The knight beside me drew his sword, and with one swift strike, he cut right through a nearby bush. Or maybe it was a small tree? Woo, woo there! What if it was a person, I thought, peering around the night? There sat a furball, frozen in terror. It was some kind of animal, but its fur was so long that I couldn't tell what type. It was just a rabbit, the knight told Papa, surprising me. That was a rabbit? Rabbits are supposed to have short hair, long ears, standing straight up, and twitchy little noses like the North Netherland dwarf and the Japanese white breeds. Oh, maybe this is a breed raised for fur farming? Not a chinchilla. Hmm. I can't remember what they're called. Anyways, it hasn't moved a muscle this whole time. I wonder if the rabbit's okay. I looked around checking for danger, then approached the rabbit. Are you okay? I called out in a calming voice and reached out to the rabbit, who finally reacted, dashing off into the forest. It ran away. It ran away from me. I was so stunned that I couldn't even react. But the presence of the people behind me brought me back to my senses. Oh, right. They're all here. It didn't occur to me since usually Dan or Lesson accompanying me, but come to think of it, wild animals were sensitive, so it must have been startled by the knights. Let's get out of here before the smell of blood draws in monsters. The smell of blood? There was a faint trace of blood on the ground where the rabbit had been. That rabbit was injured by the sword? I set off running. I knew intellectually it was a bad idea, but I couldn't abandon an injured animal. My lady, Nima! I'm sorry, please follow me preferably without falling into a murderous rage. I ran as fast as I could in the direction the rabbit had fled. I wanted to find it before my pursuers found me and dragged me back. Soaring behind me, I heard shouts of, My lady! and the rustling cr crunch of leaves and twigs. This is kind of scary. Maybe it's a psychological effect of being chased, but these sounds are panic-inducing. But at least I don't have to worry about getting separated from everyone and ending up hopelessly lost. Oh, there it is! Probably because of its injury, the rabbit hadn't gone far. Come here. I'll take care of your wound, okay? I said softly because of the rabbit's frantic flight. Blood stained its long fur. It hobbled toward me, favoring its injured side. Thank goodness. For a second there, I'd lied, lost my animal charming ability. It was just scared and injured. I carefully picked up the rabbit and headed in the direction I'd come from. Just then I heard a rustling sound and turned around it and turned toward it, assuming the knights had caught up with me. Ew, crap. I thought it was beloved by God. Clearly I thought wrong. I was face to face with a green skinned monster just a little taller than myself. It was a goblin. The goblin was only wearing a cloth tied around its hips in a style more appropriate to the climate of the southern territory. I felt cold just looking at him. Don't you know this is the north? It doesn't matter how much of a monster you are, you must be freezing. 
Oh, the moron to stand there observing the goblin. Go on, call me an idiot. I won't deny it, I'm a huge idiot. The goblin wasn't alone either. Maybe they'd been hunting as a team because four of them stood in formation fanned out behind me. Suddenly something was thrown over me from behind, and I was being carried away unable to move. Damn it, I need to tend to this rabbit's wound. Due to the irresistible beacon God had set before me, I, Nefertima, had been kidnapped by goblins. Papa, this is all God's doing after all. In any case, it looks like I'm heading for the goblin's nest, so please come rescue me. I would leave asking Soul for help as a last resort. Yeah, you don't want that. How did it turn out like this? Ow, that hurt. Treat your hostages a little better, won't you? I'd been dumped unceremoniously on the ground, my right shoulder taking the brunt of the impact. Is the rabbit okay? The rabbit, trapped inside the bag with me, struggled in my arms. Thank goodness, it looks like the bleeding has stopped. I was dragged out of the bag only to find myself surrounded by goblins. There were so many. An uncountable number of goblins were living in a giant hut, by all appearances naturally occurring cave. Or gigantic butt. Sorry. Hey, they're all gathering around me excitedly. I think they might even be drooling. Hey guys, I'm not food! Huh? It's not me the goblins are looking at. Their gazes are focused on a bit lower. You can't eat this little rabbit, I cried. As they understood me, the goblins' gazes grew sorrowful. Too bad, you still can't eat her. Anyways, why did you bring me here, I demanded. At this, they all tilted their heads to the side in confusion. Hmm? <laughs> all at the same day, too. That's funny. Darn it, they are cute, aren't they? No, wait. I'm not thinking that. Not me. No, sorry. I actually will not give in to temptation. A single goblin approached, still drooling. I won't give you the rabbit, I thought, glaring at the goblin, but he didn't seem bothered as he took my hand and tugged it gently. Uh, I think he wants me to follow him. Having no better plan, I let the goblin lead me until we came to an alcove. This time, the goblin pushed me gently from behind, so I obligingly stepped into the alcove. I thought it would be pitch black, but the walls glowed with a soft green light. Luminous moss, maybe? And people were in the alcove. Wait, people? I did a double take. Then a triple take, but there were indeed two girls a bit older than me in the tunnel. Their faces looked similar, so I guessed they were sisters. Were you kidnapped too? One of the girls asked in a beautifully lit... Lilting voice. Yeah, you too, I asked. Hm, can't you tell by looking? We weren't brought... Wouldn't be here if we were kidnapped. Or weren't kidnapped. I suppose she has a point. Uh-oh. Please don't tell me this is another goblin slayer situation. If it's so, the second girl had a prickly personality. I'm Nino, and this is my older brother, Pino, the second girl offered gruffly. Older brother? Oops, looks like he actually is actually a boy. Sorry, my bad. Both of them possessed the kind of beauty that would make angels weep. Unfortunately, due to the dim light, I couldn't make out the color of their hair and eyes. I'm Nima, nice to meet you. It was my first time speaking with children around the same age as me. Just to be safe, I kept my backpack background a secret. Besides us, some adults were abducted too. They're being kept somewhere else, though, so we can't see them. Pino, to Pino told me what he knew. However, it wasn't... Me, I thought it was just me, but now there was all the more reason to pray for a speedy rescue. If I used Soul's power, it would be over quickly, but it seemed a shame to blow this place to smithereens without gathering any information. Besides, if I used fire magic in an enclosed space like a cave, wouldn't it lead to lack of oxygen? Maybe if I used wind at the same time, it would be okay? Hey, Soul, is it okay to use fire magic inside a cave? Will it create a lack of oxygen, I asked, through our telepathic link? Why are you asking such a strange question all of a sudden? He responded. Hmm, I think it would be okay as long as you create wind as well. Well, you see... I'm inside a goblin nest right now, and there are other captives here as well, so I'm trying to figure out how to help them. Soul responded with silence. Uh-oh. ID? Oh dear, I've shocked Soul senseless. Using my magic is possible, but aiming it only at the goblins is not. It would be different if I could see them, but operating telepathically, I'm afraid it's beyond my abilities, he explained. So there were some things even Soul couldn't do, huh? Sounded like I couldn't count on Soul to get me out of this one. If you could, could control my magic, it might be possible, he suggested. No way, I can't. I'm too afraid to do something like that. I didn't have any magic of my own. There's no way I could successfully bust out and do something in the heat of the moment that I've never even attempted before. All there is to do is wait for Papa and his men to rescue us. I hope Knox was able to follow us home and will let them know where we are. Or follow us here and let them know where we are. That will put all, us put all that training we've been doing to good use, Knox. As I was thinking that, my stomach let out a loud growl. I'm so hungry and I didn't even get to eat the lunch the village chief's wife packed. What a waste. 
can't believe you to feel hungry at a time like this. It's not my fault. I did a lot of walking today. My energy is depleted. I handed the rabbit to Pino and stepped out of the alcove. Directly beside the alcove's opening stood a goblin on guard duty. His eyes widened in surprise, not expecting anyone to even try to come out. He clearly didn't realize I was so close to him. That's why he is so surprised. I'm hungry. I pointed to my stomach, trying to convey my hunger to him. The goblin called to one of his companions. I had no idea what he was saying, but it seemed I got my point across. Maybe goblins are smarter than I thought. The other goblin brought some fruits that looked like long, thin persimmons. I'd never seen them before, but they looked like they were probably edible. I wiped the fruit on my clothes and, throwing proper manners to the wind, took a huge bite. It's so bitter. Damn, that's bitter. I think my tongue is going numb. There's no way I can eat this. The goblin quickly snatched the fruit from my hands, then he peeled off the skin with his teeth. Once he removed a section of the skin, he pointed emphatically to the flesh inside. So you can't eat the skin. Should have told me that sooner. I hesitantly took a small bite of the peeled fruit. It's sweet. It has a crisp texture and the fruit is sugar, juice is sugary and delicious. Hmm, I wonder if there's any way to pull, peel it besides with your teeth. Oh, I forgot I have a dagger inside my bunny backpack. I've been forgetting I've been wearing it lately. I whipped out the dagger and set to work peeling the fruit. The second I took out the dagger, the goblin shrunk back in fear. It's fine, don't worry, I'm not some ninja who could take you all on with a single dagger. Honestly, I'm not even peeling the fruit so much as clumsily carving pieces off the outside. Sometimes it's inconvenient being so tiny. Once I removed the skin, I helped myself to the delicious interior. The goblin stared intently watching me eat with gusto. What are you looking at? If you have the time to stand around watching me eat, give me another one of these delicious fruits. I knew it was shameless and demanding, but I couldn't fight on an empty stomach. I accepted another fruit and peeled that one as well. Several goblins began copying me, attempting to eat the, peel the fruit with their rusted knives. Oh, it must never have occurred to them to use a knife to peel those fruits. The goblins handled the knives awkwardly. Whoa, be careful not to cut yourselves. While I'm at it, I'll show you how to remove the skin. Your hands are small like mine, so it's easier to shave the skin off a peeler. I finished the second fruit and took a few more for Pino and Nino. I also grabbed some of the leaves, hoping the rabbit could eat them. The goblins weren't so bad after all. They were clever and understood me. Um, I'm not sure why, but for some reason, the goblins and I seem to have become almost like friends. It's also due to the ability God gave me, so it also works on monsters, huh? I had no idea. But now I'm in a real predicament. I don't want to see them destroyed in retaliation for kidnapping me, but Papa will find us. It's only a matter of time. When he does, I don't think he'll stop to listen to what I have to say first. So how am I going to rescue all the kidnapped people and make it so the goblins can live in peace? Oh, this is so hard. Why are you guys living here anyway, I asked. Goblins didn't normally live in such a cold climate, so what were they doing in a place like this? I'm not even going to try that. Sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. The only noise is they can make real screeching sounds like gee and guh. Just then a commotion happened near the entrance of the cave. It appeared that a group of goblins who'd been out hunting had just returned. There are even more of them? Just how many are there? They carry two giant boar piglets into the cave. Oh no, they've become the prey of the goblin hunters. I suppose it makes sense that the harlots targeted the weak. It's a natural way of things in this eater be eaten world. But I can't help feeling sorry for the giant boar piglets. At the same time, I also couldn't help being impressed. The goblins could hardly use a knife, and yet they took down not one but two giant boar piglets larger and stronger than themselves. I was so lost in thought that I failed to notice. A shadow fell over me. Why is one of the human children out here? You can speak, I cried? I can't believe it. He looked like a goblin, but was much larger than the others. Maybe a hob- Yeah, maybe he was a hob goblin. In any case, why could he speak? You idiots kidnapped another one? I told you to stop doing that. Wait just a minute, I interjected. Right, first things first, let's clarify the situation. I've got some questions, and you're going to answer them. Got it? I said with authority. I'll take your silence as agreement. First, are you these guys' leader, I asked? Yeah, I'm the boss of this clan. Well, that's the answer I was expecting. Second, why are you kidnapping people? Women are the spoils of war, so it's an ingrained instinct for them. Huh? A natural instinct? Since when do God always exhibit this kind of behavior? Either this was a fact I'd missed when amassing my vast knowledge of geeky hobbies... Or it was a trait specific to the goblins in this world. I had no idea which. Instinct? Kidnapping children is instinctual for goblins? In their minds, it's not kidnapping. They think they're saving lost children. Goblins treasure all children, including human children. Good grief, so I was just being babysat this whole time. I wasn't lost, though. Yeah, definitely not. My father was not far behind. Third, why do you attack humans? To survive. That's the entire reason I brought them here. Alright, here it comes. 
I have a feeling he's about to get to the meat and bones of the story. Why did you leave your previous home, I asked. After hearing this question, the hobgoblin's expression changed for the first time, or at least I think it did. It was hard to tell. I couldn't say with confidence either way. We were attacked by humans in the forest. Not just as goblins, but the kobolds, orcs, and ogres too. Oh, so it wasn't God's doing after all. Either that, or maybe he's manipulating the situation behind the scenes. Moving in the shadows. But if you're going to go with all that trouble, do it yourself. Yeesh. But why come this far north? Surely there was somewhere else you could have gone. The hobgoblin, quiet, the hobgoblin quietly shook his head. The humans pursued us everywhere we went. The ogres are a warlike species, so they fought back and were almost entirely wiped out. As for the orcs, they aren't suited to the cold climate. They either froze to death or stayed in the south despite the danger. We are weak, so we fled, but even so, many of us were killed along the way. So many. I hadn't heard anything about such a large-scale punitive force being formed, so this was probably wasn't the work of the royal knighthood. And I got the impression the issue crossed country borders, meaning it wasn't a problem exclusive to the kingdom of Gashe. That meant there was guild involvement of the Church of Divine Creation was up to something. And if it was the church, it stood the reason that maybe the kingdom of Gashe wasn't the only victim. The drought that had brought Icox to its knees last year immediately came to mind. Our king was well known for hating when the Church of Divine Creation tried to get involved with politics, so that might have something to do with it. I decided then and there to have Papa investigate whether similar things were happening in Milma and the Linus Empire. But what to do about these goblins? Maybe we can establish a goblin village here where they could live freely and be self-sufficient? But wait, if we do that, there's a lot they need to learn first. We'd need to teach them how to hunt, farm, tan leather, and preserve food. Ugh, that sounds like so much work. Forget that plan. Um, so what do you guys want to do now? Are you planning to get revenge on humans? It became a bit overwhelming to think through, so I started by asking how the goblins would like to live from here on out. Although, if they did want to get revenge against humans, I couldn't just stand by and let them. I want to go back to how things were, hunting and being hunted by animals and other monsters. We want to be an essential species to the survival of the forest. Essential to the survival of the forest, huh? No matter how you looked at it, the goblins played the role of prey. That's probably why nature designed them to reproduce and mature so quickly. That meant that if we protected only the goblins, it would throw off the natural balance. So maybe we should put them all together? Not here, but on a mountain closer to the royal city. We can let the og goblins, ogres, orcs, and other persecuted monsters live together. Mama can help arrange a magical barrier to prevent them from leaving the mountain and heading into the human villages. The only problem is the money it would cost to put this plan into action, and even if there are predators, we'd still need to find a way to thin out their numbers somehow. Hmm. I guess a labyrinth dungeon would be overdoing it a little? No, but we can make it like a survivalist training ground exclusively for low-ranking guild members and set up an item shop at the foot of the mountain. That might work. How about this? It was a rough plan, but I told the hobgoblin about the idea I'd come up with. It's okay if we kill humans? Well, it's a battle to survive, after all. The humans who enter the mountain will be informed of the situation in advance, and whoever defeats them can keep their possessions. It should be fine as long as we have the humans sign a waiver, and make it clear up front that we can't guarantee their safety, right? I'll leave the complex legal details up to Papa to hammer out. It might have been a ruthless plan, but God had brought the goblins and me together, and in any case... Whenever something someone dies, whether human or monster, blame it on God for deciding it's their time and leave me out of it, please. The real problem is figuring out how to handle my father and his men once they get here, I sighed. Aha, this is just the right time to take Sol up on his promise to lend me his power when I'm in trouble. I'm really on a roll today, it's almost scary. Will you please promise to let me deal with them, I requested. It's fine with me, but what are you planning to do? <laughs> I'm going to get the ace up my sleeve to lend me his power. Ace up your sleeve. The hobgoblin tilted his head in confusion at the unfamiliar expression. This seems to be a standard gesture for these guys, huh? I wasted no time in explaining the situation to Sol. The goblins seemed confused by the sight of me communicating telepathically, so I explained what I was doing and they seemed to accept my strange behavior. Now that I had a plan, it was time to brainstorm battle strategies. It is what I wanted to say, but unfortunately we faced a tall hurdle and that the extent of the other party's fighting ability was unknown. No matter how much I searched my memory, I never seen my family use any offensive magic. All I knew was that my father possessed such strong fire magic that it tended to leak out whenever he lost control of his emotions and I had no information whatsoever regarding the subordinates he brought. As for the knights, I could only assume since they'd been accepted into the royal knighthood, they must be powerful. This isn't good. Even though I knew how critical information was, I had almost none. I went back and forth with Sol and the Hobgoblin, hashing out potential patterns for how the conf confrontation might go. Time seemed to pass in the blink of an eye, and almost before I knew it, darkness had fallen over the forest. If I'm going to make a move, they most likely do it under the cover of darkness, right? I also told Pino and Nino that help was on the way and convinced them to help a little. Now all I had to do was go outside once Papa and his men arrived. It should be a piece of cake, right? The objective was to prevent Papa and his men from striking first and ask questions later. 
Things might take a turn for the worse, but I'd be fine. I must make sure to use Soul's protective magic on myself first. All right, first things first. I need to get everything ready. I entrust the nocturnal animals with strong night vision with the task of alerting me when humans approach the cave. I thought about summoning Nox, but figured she was with Papa and the others, so I decided not to. And finally, it might seem childish, but I also set up a bit of a booby trap. It was more for peace of mind than anything else, honestly. All right, we're ready for you. Yeah, I'm sorry I underestimated you, Papa. A single kiwi entered the cave. Kiwis were small animals with long bodies, short legs, and dark brown fur. They resembled weasels, except their tails were twice the length of their bodies. They also had sharp claws and protruding fangs that made them perfectly adapted for surviving in the forest. They were known for being aggressive despite their small size, so if you tried to touch them like a pet, you'd probably be in for an unpleasant surprise. The kiwi informed me that humans had approached the cave. I patted the kiwi's neck to express my gratitude, and while I was at it, indulged my desire to stroke its tail. The tail could be used like a whip for attacking, wrapping around a tree branch like a rope to support their body, or the tip could be used like bait to lure smaller prey. The kiwis were blessed by evolution. They were incredibly flexible and possessed the dense fur characteristics of animals native to the cold northern climate. I bet it would feel amazing if I wrapped him around my neck like a scarf. Of course I won't, though. He probably wouldn't enjoy that much. I gave the kiwi a scrap of giant for me as a reward for obediently letting me pet it. Sigh. The sight of animals happily munching on their food is so calming and uplifting. What am I doing? There's no time to be slacking off. Pino, Nino, I'm counting on you. Just do what we talked about in the meeting. We got it already. We'll do whatever we have to if it means we can go home, Nino equip quipped. Oh, they're motivated. That's great. As I figured, the quickest way to motivate a prideful girl is to mention her, question her capability. I'll keep the details of the conversation to myself. I'll take care of the rabbit as we agreed, Pino added. To be safe, I'd entrust the injured rabbit to Pino. I figured that no matter how this turned out, these two would be rescued safely. It won't be long now, just be patient a little while longer. I stroked the fur ball of a rabbit and she twitched her nose happily. When everything was said and done, I'd beg my parents to let me keep her at our house as a pet. Pino and Nino walked out of the cave, fearfully looking over their shoulders. It was an act that they were playing out perfectly per my battle plan. A moment later, three of the fastest goblins rushed out of the cave as if chasing the human children. Of course, I'd use soul's protection magic on them in advance. Why are you doing that? You're going to make them think the goblins are, you know, bad. As for the hobgoblin and I, in addition to protective magic, we used a sound enhanced spell so we could hear what was going on outside. Oh no, Nino screamed. It was pretty sure it was just part of the act. Nino, over here! As I requested, the two were following the script of being discovered immediately after escaping from the goblins. A goblin screeched as if saying, Catch them! The goblins were surprisingly good actors. Just then, there were two other children. It was faint, but I heard a human voice. There was a pause and then, Rescue them! It was Papa's voice! But doing so will reveal our presence to the goblins. I suppose this meant what we, well, it must be one of his subordinates. Blah, 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 blah. Does he mean to ignore children fleeing for their lives? How cold-blooded can you be? That's fine. Of course Papa would never abandon a child in need. But is it just a guy imagination, or does Papa seem a little different from usual? Uh-oh. I heard a rustling sound and the pattern of foot, patter of footsteps and the clanking of armor. Based on the noise, I guess that two, maybe three knights were on the move. This way. One led Pino and Nino off into the forest, and the others took up position to apprehend the goblins. However, the goblins turned and dashed back into the cave as if the demons of hell were on their heels. Their speed is a crucial part of my plan. Once the goblins made it back in safely, I signaled to the hobgoblin. Without saying anything, he nodded faintly and went outside. The hobgoblin deliberately made a target of himself at my request to prevent the humans from using magic to blow up the entrance to the cave the goblins had fled into. We'll return those children now be gone from this place, humans. How rare, a hobgoblin with the ability to speak. My father came walking out of the forest completely defenseless. He wore the aura of flames drawn around him like a cloak, but his voice was cold as ice. Oh, scary, that's not my papa. It is, he's just mad. Why don't you go ahead and... How do you even know that he even... They even have her? Did y'all track her? Why don't you go ahead and return Nefertima to me? It's already well past her bedtime, after all. Suddenly, a roaring sound cut through the night, the echo of the loud noise echoing off the walls of the cave. Panicked, I peeled outside, peeked outside. I saw my father wrapped in flames of what looked like a giant snake made of fire hanging, lunging toward the hobgoblin. The fire snake bounced off an invisible barrier, scant inches from devouring the hobgoblin. Well, I suppose it didn't bounce off as much as break in half. A burning stench filled the air. Nefertima, come out here right now, Papa called, ignoring the hobgoblin and approaching the cave's entrance. His voice was one I'd never heard before, cold and fierce as a blizzard. I think this means he saw through our, seen through our ruse, right? And he's very, very angry. Checkmate. I can't believe you figured it out so quickly. Now I'm really in trouble. What should I do? I suppose the best course of action is to apologize and explain the situation. Soul, can you project my voice so my father can hear me? It's over already? How anticlimactic. You may speak now. 
anticlimactic. Is he sitting back and watching this unfold as a form of entertainment? Probably. Maybe. Who knows what he has for entertainment where he is. Father, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're apologizing for, but come out here and let me see you to set my mind at ease. The cold, biting edge to his voice had softened from blizzard level to merely a heavy snow. But I couldn't let my guard down. You won't get angry and you won't use magic? <sighs> Fine. I won't get angry and I won't use magic, I promise. I suppose I could take him at his word. Papa would never lie to a child. Uh... I don't know. And he's never broken a promise to me in the past. Father! I exited the cave, running for Papa. I threw myself into his arms and the hug was returned a hundredfold. Uh, too tight. That hurts. It was a touching scene like something out of a movie, but I had to keep Papa in a good mood for there to be any hope of this ending well. Ending well, so I endured the painfully tight hug. However, Soul's magic was still enha active, enhancing my hearing, so I heard it clearly, the sound of everyone chanting the incantation to a spell. Uh oh Soul, protect the cave! A wall of fire appeared in front of the cave entrance. Simultaneously, a huge ball of fire crashed into it. The fireball was absorbed into the wall of fire, becoming nothing more than fuel to add to the fire's wall's strength. I moved away from Papa, throwing myself in front of the hobgoblin like a shield. I knew that none of the humans here would dare to attack me. Nima, I understand you're the only one who promised not to use magic, but I won't let any of you kill these goblins. Papa promised not to use magic, but his men made no such promise. Even so, read the air, will ya? This is a critical moment. Why do you protect them? Because they were only being manipulated by humans. At long last, I was able to explain the situation to Papa. The hobgoblin jumped in from time to time, providing supplementary information. While we spoke, Papa switched modes from protected father to prime minister of the kingdom of Gashi as he listened carefully to our story. Maybe we're not all the way to checkmate yet, after all. When I asked Papa how he knew I was involved, he explained that even if they were children, Pino and Nino should have known better than to escape when all the goblins had returned to the nest. They would have known that running away in the daytime when the goblins went out to hunt would give them the best chance to, of encountering someone to help them. When he'd gotten suspicions and tried using magic, he found a strong protective spe protection spell was cast on the hobgo in which he figured could only be soul's magic. Yikes, I'm no match for Papa's powers of perception. Nope, you are not. After that, since we'd come to a tentative truce with the goblins, I emphatically reiterated they wouldn't do anything to harm the humans currently present. Even so, Papa's men showed no sign of loosening their fighting stances. Good grief, I'm exhausted. Let's stop standing around outside talking and either return to the village or go inside the cave. I tried suggesting this to Papa, and he said it was dangerous to travel through the forest at night, so he spent the night in the cave. His men didn't suddenly trust the goblins, but they most likely figured they could take them no matter how many goblins there were. Oh, well, I asked Sol to get rid of the wall of fire. Pino, Nino, are you okay? I asked. They'd agreed to help me with my plan, but it had gotten derailed pretty early on, so I needed to explain to them what happened. And a bird call rang through the air. It's Nox! I can tell from the pitch of her cry that she's warning us of danger. Maybe a carnivorous nocturnal animal is approaching? I looked up in the direction Nox cry had come from to see eight orbs glowing with blue light floating in the air. What is that? Look out! The hobgoblin rushed toward me. Apparently he knew what those things were. So I'll please make several fires that size of torches. Very well, what's happening? I'm not sure, but there's something here. Like foxfire, three orbs of fire blinked into life around me. The fires illuminated the looming figure of a spider. Of course, the frost spiders! Calm down and think. First, how did such a freaking massive spider get so close without making any noise? Oh, and also, is it even okay to refer to this thing as a spider? Its exoskeleton is much more sturdy than any spider I've ever seen, and it looks more like a crab than a spider. Not to mention its coloring is a model pattern of white and green. Is this supposed to be camouflage? Frost spider. Aha, uh -huh, so this is what a frost spider looks like, huh? The only sense I got from this frost spider was a strong sense of hunger and desperation. I understand you're hungry, but why are you so desperate? I tried to ask but the frost spider was locked in a staring competition with the hobgoblin and didn't reply. Oh, right. From the frost spider's perspective, there's food right in front of her. In nature, it was an eat-or-be-eaten battle for survival. It wasn't much I could do except take the chance that the hobgoblin was giving me by drawing the frost spider's attention and fleeing back to where my father stood, so I wouldn't get caught in the middle of the ensuing fight. The frost spider raised its right front leg in a massive sweep and attempted to skewer the hobgoblin with it. The spider's front legs appeared to be sharp at the ends, as if maybe it had claws on those legs? The hobgoblin definitely leaped out of the way. In a single leap, he covered a distance of more than six feet. It was a struggle to restrain myself from commenting on his incredible jumping ability. The hobgoblin leaped into the air, plummeting down on the frost spider from above with his fist in front of him. With the wet popping sound similar to an egg cracking, one of the frost spider's eyes burst. Ooh, that sounds painful. Probably in anger, the frost spider clicked its fangs together, dripping liquid that I presumed to be poison. 
The hobgoblin landed safely on the ground, but his fist was covered in blood. He was trying to wipe it away when the frost spider bent all eight of its legs and leaped into the air. As you can imagine, it was targeting the hobgoblin. There was a the sound of bodies crashing together, and I unconsciously gasped. I knew that if it looked like the hobgoblin was going to lose, Papa would light them both up with his hellfire without even batting an eye. He would do whatever was necessary to prioritize and prior necessary and prioritize the survival of us humans. There may be a difference in power, but we two were fighting to survive. I understood it. I might not be able to accept it, but I didn't understand. Whether the hobgoblin or the frost spider won, the real victor would be us. I heard a strange sound. The frost spider was an insect, so it couldn't speak. Next, I heard a cracking and popping sound like something was being broken apart. The frost spider was clicking its fangs together nonstop. What on earth was happening? All I knew was that the hobgoblin was unharmed. Soul's protective magic was ineffective not only against magical attacks, but physical attacks as well. Help me. So that's what it was. I finally got a lock on the frost spider's thoughts. Her desperation was regarding her children. I wasn't sure of its exact biology, but the frost spider had children in her stomach. Maybe she was incubating the eggs inside her stomach, and until they got to a certain size, they would grow inside her like a parasite? She needed to eat a lot to nurture her children as well, but she hadn't been able to catch any prey and had gradually grown weaker and weaker. She couldn't even seem to catch any of the animals she could normally catch with ease. It made sense the sudden introduction of such a large clan of goblins must have upset the delicate ecosystem of the forest. When you look at it this way, she was also a victim. I couldn't see what the hobgoblin was doing, but the life slowly left the frost spider's eyes. At some point, the sound of the spider's fangs clicking also faded away, and suddenly the frost spider's body fell to the floor. Then the hobgoblin pushed the spider's body up and climbed out from underneath it. I should probably comment on his incredible arm strength at this point. I never heard of such a powerful hobgoblin before. Is this normal for the hobgoblins in this world? The frost spider was turned upside down, and finally I could see what the hobgoblin had done. He'd used brute strength to break through the spider's exoskeleton at the joint where its chest met its stomach, and it eaten parts of the insides. Ew. Blood painted the hot goblin's entire body, and a copious amount soaked the ground around him. They say that mothers are the strongest creatures in the world, but she had become so weak that she couldn't win this fight. I approached the frost spider's corpse and stroked its chest. My hand became wet with blood, but I didn't pay it any mind. I wasn't fond of God, but right now I wanted to ask him a favor. I prayed that whatever, whether they went to heaven or were, were reborn, she and her children would be together and be happy. Such hypocrisy. I'm the one who killed her. She died because of my ego. I'm sorry. Just then the frost spider's stomach moved, or rather swelled up. I stared at the spider's stomach, watching a tiny single spider crawl out of the massive hole in it. If she weren't already torn apart, the babies would have ripped open her stomach to crawl out. That's terrifying. I continued to watch expectantly, assuming that many more babies would come crawling out, but there only seemed to be one. Huh? Isn't it weird for there to only be one? Spiders usually lay tons of eggs at once. A long time ago, a spider had laid eggs in my apartment, and when they hatched, it was an absolute nightmare. The way the tiny baby spider, not even a quarter of an inch long, explored its surroundings on eight pitter-pattering legs while leaving a trail of spider web behind it was enough to make me break out in goosebumps and want to spray the entire area with pesticide. While the baby spider and I stared each other down, Nox, having decided it was safe, flew to my side. Once she approached the baby spider, Nox let out a screech and spread her wings intimidatingly. That seemed to surprise the baby spider because it held out its two front legs as wide as possible and began waving them. Come to think of it, I was pretty sure I'd heard somewhere that spiders spread out their front legs to make themselves look bigger to scare off predators. She's trying to scare off Nox, is she? It looks more like a dance than anything threatening, though. The movement is funny and even kind of cute. Alright, Nox, keep it up. Who would have ever guessed the day would come where I would find a spider cute after that nightmarish experience in my apartment? I want to bring her home as a pet, too. Nima, Papa said softly, laying his hand on my shoulder. Don't he, Does he think I'm impressed? I am a little sad, but the baby spider helped cheer me up. I'm okay. No matter the situation, the strong always survive and the weak perish. It's not my place to interfere with the way of nature just for my own selfish feelings. Papa hugged me tightly as if saying he was proud of me for my mature insight, but I couldn't deny that I would have liked to save her if I could. Maybe I could have saved her, but I didn't. I'd been too afraid. If I had saved her, the responsibility for that act would have all fallen onto me. I didn't have the confidence that I would be able to handle such a responsibility. I hated how small and powerless I was. I wanted to become strong. I wasn't picky about the species. I just wanted to be able to get by on my own in the environment where animals lived. And for this reason, I wanted to become a more capable version of myself. As the hobgoblin had said, all creatures fundamentally want to be necessary for the balance of nature. I'm going to get stronger, I promise, so please forgive me for not being able to do anything this time. I cried my heart out, wrapped safely in Papa's arms. I wasn't sure I had cried this much since I was a baby. Nox, the hobgoblin, and all of Papa's men watched us warily. They didn't seem to be so taken aback. How old is she by this point? Five? Huh? 
Hold on, Mr. Hobgoblin. Isn't there something strange about you? I rub my eyes, attempting to clear my tear-blurred vision. Papa silently stood up, stopped, and hit, stopped me, and handed me his handkerchief, to which I gratefully accepted and used to wipe away my tears. While I was at it, I blew my nose and wiped the blood from my hand. Feeling much better, I turned back to examine the Hobgoblin once more. A mysterious sparkling effect surrounded him, and an aura encased by like fire. What? Uh, is it leveling up? Is he evolving? What is that, Papa? The aura became so strong that I could no longer see the Hobgoblin's figure. There was a loud kaboom, and it suddenly the sparkling effect in the area dissipated, revealing a different creature standing where the Hobgoblin had been. I call it a creature, but it looks similar to a human. Its body was almost identical to that of a human with a lean build. Its ivory skin was covered in what looked like green tattoos, and his ears were ever so slightly pointed. His blue hair and red eyes made an eye-catching combination. Two black horns were growing from the top of his head. Hello? Who are you? He evolved, Papa muttered in disbelief. The disbelief in his voice led me to believe that Papa wasn't quite sure what had happened either. Is that you, Hopgoblin, I ventured? Yes. What happened? Don't ask me. I was just wondering the same thing. How could he not know what happened to him? When in doubt, ask Soul. Soul, I think the Hobgoblin just evolved or something? The evolved form of a goblin is a hobgoblin. They don't possess any further evolution, but he literally transformed right in front of my eyes into a human-like form. He does have horns, though. Horns, you say? The only creatures I know of that match that description are a species called Oni that lived in the continent of Wazite. They have the bodies of humans and horns on their heads. From what I can remember, Wazite was southwest of Larsia and was only about half the size. Hmm, trying to picture it in terms of my old world, Larsia is like Eurasia and Wazite is like Africa, roughly. Oni? Huh? I suppose it does resemble the Japanese creature called Oni, but Japanese Oni aren't nearly this flashy looking. Japanese Oni only come, only come in red, blue, green, and black, right? Why is that anyway? If there were yellow Oni instead of black ones, they'd have all primary, four primary covers, colors covered. Seems like a waste. I'd like to see it for myself. There isn't room for you to land here, Sol. I see. In that case, how about the village where you stayed last night? The village was tiny, but there was probably no space for Sol to land, right? I think that would work. Very well, then let us reconvene tomorrow for the first time in quite a while. Sometimes Sol used very antiquated language, which I had trouble understanding. I think he's saying he wants to meet tomorrow. Yeah, that's gonna be it. I asked Sol, and he thinks this might be a species from the continent of Wasite called an Oni. An Oni? Whoa, nice reaction, Papa. He also said he'll come here tomorrow to see him. Oh, right, I forgot something important. Father, please give him something to wear. The former hobgoblin was butt naked. I didn't know where to turn my eyes. <laughs> Papa, embarrassed for failing to notice the problem sooner, hurried to snatch a trench coat from one of his men and give it to the former hobgoblin. I felt a little sorry for the man whose coat had been stolen. Whoops. The former hobgoblin smiled faintly as he hesitantly put on the trench coat, but... Oh no, I'm about to burst out laughing at an inappropriate moment, but I can't help it. He looks like a quintessential flasher. <laughs> Make sure you clean the front properly, and whatever you do, don't let it slip open. You'll get arrested for public indecency. Maybe not in the village, but everywhere else probably. Well, when it came to this former hobgoblin's muscular figure, many young ladies probably wouldn't mind ogling it. Seeing the former hobgoblin struggling to button the coat, I went to help him. I had something important to tell him while I was at it. Thank you for saving me. I even gave him a hug for good measure. Now that he had an almost human body, he had neither fur nor scales, so the hug was a little underwhelming. Nima! Yeah, yeah, Papa, don't you know that jealousy is a disgraceful trait in a man? In any case, now it's finally time for sleep. Pino was already sleeping. I can't believe he fell asleep... Amidst all this commotion, Nino looks astounded as well. I wasn't sure if he was brazen or just moving at his own pace, but either way, I had a feeling he'd grow up to be a force to be reckoned with in the future. And he wasn't the only one. Are you two still at it? You're just playing, right? Yeesh. Nox, you do know that's not an enemy, right? There, there, good girl. Thank you for leading Papa and his men to find me. Nox climbed up on my shoulder because being petted put her in a good mood. What does she look so smug for, huh? What would you do? Do you want to come with me? Or do you want to stay in this forest where your mother lived, I asked the spider. I hadn't noticed it before, but the baby spider was black in color. I didn't think her father was a different species, so it must mean that her color could change as she matured. Even so, a white base color with green splotches stood out. Black was much more spider-esque, in my opinion. The baby spider swayed back and forth in indecision. Then, making up her mind, she leaped into my arm and climbed steadily up my shoulder. Even spiders are cute when they're little like this. I can't imagine how you're going to think when she gets bigger. The baby spider claimed the opposite shoulder from Nox as her de facto, per de facto perch. Being careful of her eyes, I gently stroked the slight depression in the center of her back. She really was an insect. Her exoskeleton was hard like a rhinoceros beetle's horn. I was careful not to crush her while petting her. What should I name her? I looked at my contemplating this issue, and my gaze caught on the frost spider's corpse. That's right, I'll use that. 
It's one of my favorite words and a precise emo precious emotion. I'll name you Gracia. It will be a tribute to your mother from both of us for making me stronger and get for giving you life. Gracia means gratitude. It sounded like a girl's name, and I was pretty sure the spider was female, so it seemed like a good fit. Let's be good friends, Gracia. I stroked her back once more, and this time a white pattern appeared on her head between her eyes. Look at that! I think I've gone and did it again. Oh, well, I'll have to ask Sol about it tomorrow. More importantly, I'm hungry. I'll steal the emergency rations that Papa always carries around with him. <laughs> okay, this is going to have to... Uh, what time is it? How much more? To shoot. Yeah, it's going to have to wait till next time. I'll see you on the next one.